thank you very much. Actually, uh, the next session is on the fusion between wireless and multimedia, uh, 5G and multimedia and what you know they can do for each other. And so I'd like to invite uh, Naresh Soni uh, to uh, chair the session. And Naresh, uh, Naresh is known to many of us here. He has been a, a longtime friend of UCSD, longtime friend of CWC, uh, through his various leadership roles here uh, in San Diego and elsewhere, in Nokia, in uh, ST Microelectronics, uh, various other uh, innovative, uh, sorry, uh, innovation and leadership positions. But uh, Naresh, uh, one of the reasons Naresh is the great session chair for this is because he has extensive experience in both multimedia and wireless through the various generations of wireless. So Naresh, uh, it's your floor. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Sujit, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity. I think uh, this is going to be a fun session. Uh, uh, this will be on, uh, you know, what are some of the key drivers of 5G and beyond. Uh, I think, uh, as you can see, multimedia would, would be one of the biggest driver, and uh, we're going to discuss uh, about multimedia. Uh, as a side, uh, you know, uh, my background is in uh, is in uh, uh, semiconductors, uh, telecom, wireless, and I worked in uh, blue chip companies like IBM, Bell Labs, uh, Nokia, and uh, ST Micro and Interdigital, as well as uh, VC backed companies that have been acquired. And uh, uh, you know, here in San Diego, uh, we have funded uh, research at UCSD. When I was uh, one of the founders of uh, Cal IT2, which is now uh, Qualcomm Institute of Technology. And uh, uh, I've also funded research at uh, various other uh, universities and institutions. With that, I would like to uh, first introduce, uh, uh, you know, our panelist, and uh, we'll, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, first panelist uh, on this would be Diego Medina. Uh, Diego is uh, Vice President of Innovation and Partnership at Viacom uh, CBX. And uh, as you can tell, I think uh, now media is becoming a, a big uh, a driver of, uh, of uh, 5G. And uh, I, I was very impressed uh, with uh, what Diego uh, brings to the table in terms of his background and experience. He knows quite a bit about the 5G, 5G in infrastructure being in media space. He has full stack ex experience in uh, traditional emerging and interactive media for uh, Viacom. Uh, and uh, he focuses on the intersection of uh, sponsored entertainment and creative technology for channel and brand partners like MTV, Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, and uh, for brands like Burger King and Pepsi. He'll be walking through uh, various examples of entertainment that will benefit uh, from 5G and uh, his thoughts on where 5G is impacting our thinking. Uh, Diego, please. Thank you so much, Naresh. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and as Naresh mentioned, um, this is this is going to be some examples of things we've done that we think would really benefit from 5G at large. Uh, so just to start, um, you know, Viacom CBS is a global entertainment company. We create and distribute content to audiences all over the world. Uh, we do so on the ground, over television, over cable, over streaming. It's really the wide gamut of everything that entertainment can entail. Um, so one of the first things we really look at is... AR blended with live television. And this is something we've done in the past, about uh, first two years ago, and this is where we were actually able to take that, that television and that feed using video ACR and create spatial experiences in sync with live television. The example on the right is one in which we turned the television into a backboard and you were able to shoot basketballs at your television while the host of the Kids' Choice Sports Awards was also shooting basketballs, kind of creating a two-way conversation and dialogue uh, with, with the viewership kind of tied to the specific action within this kind of, uh, um, of a television event. Um, as, as you might imagine, the ability we have to create synced, augmented ex experiences uh, with live event television is something that requires a great deal of connectivity, um, a lot of lifting, and on top of that, um, just, uh, just a lot of coordination, right? Certainly, the, uh, the remote nature of, of the productions on site, right, the, the broadcast nature of the actual uh, distribution, and then the at-home experience, all independent forms of connectivity um, that, you know, needed a lot of uh, 
pre-consideration, a lot of pre-canning. And as much as we can begin to evaluate 5G as a means of introducing dynamics into these kinds of thinking, um, the, the entertainment implications are, are wild, right? Once you put these kinds of tools and these kinds of things in the hands of creatives, it's really fascinating to see what kind of things you can come up with. Uh, whether it's shooting basketballs, whether it's slime coming out of your screen, whether it's trying to find something within it. Uh, if you, if you want to check out more, you can download the Nickelodeon Screens Up app. Uh, it's something we're really proud of and kind of at the forefront of how to bring television back out into space. Um, another great example is virtual reality at festivals. And this is one I think that will really benefit from, five, from 5G, and I'll get into this in a little bit. Um, at, Clus at Clusterfest, which is a three-day music and uh, comedy festival uh, that we were throwing in San Francisco, uh, we put together a, a virtual version of that in a sense, right? Uh, VR lets us explore the spirit of the festival unbound from the nature of physical reality. So when we ask ourselves, what does this look like? It ends up being that, you know, a pinata is pooping candy on you and you have to end up de defending yourself against it. What made this really interesting is that we took uh, a selfie in advance and then placed that within the avatar of the game and then broadcast the playing of that game across the festival so that people could see people playing within the reality of Clusterfest across it. Uh, so there was three watchable stations and it's kind of this on-stage feeling. Now, we were limited to the, to, to the local area simply because of the weight of everything, but imagine if we had the ability to now create a persistent metaverse layer where we've got a virtual festival happening, experienced on the ground by people in this kind of a way, but then also being able to broadcast in and out with people at home in different experiences. Uh, pair that with the nature of maybe the personalization tied to selfies. Can we bring volumetric into this, right? And to begin really look at um, really look at kind of true life representations within this meta layer of, of VR tied to like entertainment festivals. Um, this was a lot of fun and something that you know people's experience of high fidelity VR, despite the fact that it's been around for a while, uh, there was still a lot of people absolutely floored by looking at the quality of what was feasible. Um, and, when, and this is an example of when we put this this kind of technology in the hands of creatives, you can see how fun and uh, you can see how fun and just generally entertaining the entire thing is, right? Um, technology is great because it allows us to find new ways for creatives to, to create entertainment for our viewership. Um, another great example is XR at conferences, and this is this is something that was built by the Viacom XR team in, con in um, connection with Awesomeness TV, and we use the Magic League. Um, now, this was on-set captured volumetric video that we then made available to folks on the ground at VidCon. Uh, and this person lying down in the second one, uh, is actually not, that's an actual real person. So we had the entire cube set up. The person could go out there, and through the magic leap, they could look around and, and participate and feel like they were in the show. This required a lot of coordination and actual capture, as you might imagine. And then the portability of those volumetric assets, once captured and created, allowed for a lot of flexibility and representation. So while we captured them on set, we allowed for that experience to exist within the conference for, 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 uh, for conference goers, and then we also had the overall capture of the individual talent available for fans throughout. Now, this the, the lift of this, as you might imagine, was quite heavy, both the capture, the representation, um, you know, having it there locally, and, and it really only existed within the space of the time that we could activate it. Now, these kinds of things could, could go much larger if we had, you know, facility for distribution, um, as well as just rapid capture in, in a lot of different capacities. Uh, you can look this up. It's called Light as a Feather. Uh, it's, uh, it's a cool show, uh, but more than that, you can look up more about this activation, which, which we're really proud of, and kind of um, is at the forefront of thinking about how volumetric video can find its way into entertainment experiences. Um, we look at a lot of other stuff, and I, I'm not going to get that much into it, but you know, we're always looking at XR games. We've got a large contingent of viewership associated with, with children. And then because we've got so much IP, so much personality, right, um, so many characters, we're always looking at kind of digital humans, right, or interactive avatars in some capacity to really bring that entertainment experience to life. Uh, look at something like a Bellator has got such a great personality to interact with them uh, would be a, a new means of kind of engaging that fandom, right? And it's just a different layer of entertainment that we can make available. Um, so thoughts and questions, right? Like I kind of break down 5G from my perspective in terms of like four big things. Increased speeds, lower latency, more connections, and then fixed versus mobile, right? On the increased speeds, we think... 4K, 8K video on mobile, that sounds great. But then, of course, bi-directional. Bi-directional high-speed communications that allow for 3D, holographics, volumetric, however, it may, however we uh, tend to use it. Lower latency means a lot to us just simply because we can, uh, you know, unbound ourselves from the limits of local computing, right? And we can look at real-time immersive media through that edge or the distributed computing, that makes things so much easier for us to roll out. Now, if we had been able to do uh, massive edge computing within... The cluster that's experienced, we could have expanded the footprint of how many people were there, but I was limited to the amount of GPUs I showed up with to, to, to work with on the ground. Um, and of course, then 
with lower latency, we can bring in sensor-based dynamics, right? Like, I don't have to build a self-driving car, but it would be interesting to have a, a wide variety of kind of sensors on the ground to understand how festival goers are participating, and we can begin to kind of create a, a dynamic means of, um, and, you know, fulfilling their entertainment or kind of driving optimization. Uh, and then with more connections is, is something uh, that really makes a, uh, makes a lot of sense for like huge gatherings, right? So we look at 50,000 fans on the ground somewhere, right? At, at the Super Bowl, uh, at, at Clusterfest, at Slimefest. Um, 50,000 fans with high speed bi-directional allows us to create and craft new creative programs, right? In the hands of marketers, in the hands of storytellers. These things allow for uh, consistent experience across all those fans outside of just the shared physical phenomena. That's remarkable uh, for us to explore. Uh, and of course, Personalized personalization kind of comes within that since we can actually capture information from those people and react to it and incorporate it in real time. Uh, we also think about um, you know how smart we can get these festivals and the ability we have to leverage 5G means that we can create better, faster festivals uh, with lower infrastructure costs uh, and then can have them be more remote. Right? We've got a festival in um, in Utah called Snow Globe uh, and. What's fascinating about that is that it's very remote. The entire notion of it is that you're in, you're in, you're in the snow, you're in the woods, and you can really kind of party there. Of course, having connectivity run out there is difficult, and we end up with very limited bandwidth. Right? Uh, does our ability to kind of um, eschew that fixed infrastructure allow us to create more interesting mobile dynamics and have more re reliable connectivity in more remote places? Uh, and of course, the impact that 5G would have on higher quality, lower lift remote production and virtualized production, which with COVID I think has been a very eye-opening experience for us as you know, we need to continue to create content to make events and to coordinate that remotely requires massive connectivity and reliability. Um, you know, I, I like to say 3G gave us the gig economy and 5G is gonna bring us the gigabyte economy. Um, and entertainment is about distribution. So with more facile, higher quality distribution, what new entertainment can arise? And these are the questions that we like to pose internally. And so the more we understand about this, the more we can get ahead of the game to craft new stories, to create new entertainment, and to really reinforce the ability we have to, to be at that forefront, to make sure people know, you know that we're doing everything we can to make use of every tool available to us to tell you the best story we can. Um, that's my time. Uh, I'll throw it back to you, Naresh. Thank you so much.